Hello everyone and welcome to Star Sector with me, JD Kali. Today we're going to be looking at the New Player's Guide to Trade. I've added some um, timestamps in the description to this video. Uh, it's a longer video and so you may want to use those to navigate around to the topics you're interested in. Uh, I would recommend watching the whole thing if you're new because these topics do somewhat build on one another. But anyway, uh, thanks for joining me and let's get started. Our first topic today will be Trade Basics. All right, now for the basics of trade. To understand trade in Star Sector, you need to understand how Star Sector abstracts the concepts of an economy for the purposes of gameplay. So, for, to get a good handle on this, we're going to go look at the Colony Info screen. To get to the Colony Info screen, you go to Trade Goods or Hire Crew, and then you go to here to the top left and click on the Colony Info button or press M. Now here you can see a description of everything going on here at Jongala. And most importantly, a description of the economy here on the right side of the screen. Now to understand where these numbers are coming from and what they mean, you need to understand how production and demand works in Star Sector. And it's not production and consumption, it's production and demand. That's an important distinction. So in Star Sector, goods are produced by producers and demanded by demanding industries. So producing industries and demanding industries. Um, most industries are both. For example, we look here at farming. Farming is producing seven food and demanding three heavy machinery. Uh, another thing over here, the heavy batteries produce um, nothing other than defenses, but economy-wise, they do consume six supplies, six marines, and four heavy weapons. So, okay, we have these productions demands. Well, how, how does this work? Well, a producer does not produce an absolute number. You don't have to have a sum of um, the goods. For example, we have, let's see, this is consuming, or not consuming, wrong word, demanding three heavy machinery. This is demanding three heavy machinery. Let's see if anybody else is. Okay, so we have three heavy machinery demand here. However, that does not mean we have a demand of six. It means we have a demand of three. If we have an industry that produces three heavy machinery at this planet, that would meet the demand of both industries, not just one of them, because that's how Star Sector abstracts the economy. Producers produce a level of goods. So, a, for instance, this level 7 um, producing farm. It, level is the description of the number of goods produced. It is a level 7 producer. Can supply the demand of any level 7 or below demand in the sector. So, a single planet could hypothetically fill all of the goods for a specific commodity for the entire sector. Now I say hypothetically because there are some modifiers that prevent that from happening. But if we look here, we can see an example of what I mean. So again, three goods demanded here in the, uh, the heavy machinery, as well as three here. But if we go over to commodities, the demand is three. And if you look here in this window, you see maximum demand is three three needed by farming, three needed by mining. If we take a look at, say, supplies, we get a big old list. The maximum demand of this is seven by the Star Fortress. The minimum is population and infra infrastructure. They only need three, but obviously this is not a sum of all the industries that are demanding things. This is just the highest. So as long as you have enough for the highest demand, you have enough for all the demand. Okay, now, Moving on to accessibility. Accessibility is a description of how easy it is to export and input goods or import goods to a market. Um, this can be modified by many things from distance and uh, several industries can affect it, such as a spaceport, a free port, several other things. And uh, what this does is it modifies um, the number here, the, the level. So for example, 60% access, 63% access will limit 
uh, the exports here. In fact, you can see this in the effects. Other imports and exports are limited to six units. This means that even though this farm is producing at level seven, it can only export at a level of six. Now I mentioned that you know an industry could theoretically supply the entire sector, but accessibility keeps this from being true because as distance increases, your accessibility drops and the, uh, the planets are no longer able to produce enough at a distance for other in or for the industries on you know, distant planets. Accessibility does affect importation, but it's extremely generous. Um, as the, the wiki describes, even if you only had 2% accessibility, it would only reduce your uh, available importation to level five which is really good, uh, 2% um, accessibility on exportation, I think would prevent exports or limit them to level one. So obviously importation, you shouldn't really worry too much about accessibility. All right, now on to stability. All right, on to stability. Stability is a measure of the risk involved in trading in a market, or the perceived risk, how confident people are in trading in that market. As you can see, people are very comfortable trading at Jean Gaulle. It seems to be a very safe place. Uh, if you look down below on the tooltip, it has a base value of five, so that's what colonies have as a base value, um, a plus five modifier, and then they have domestic goods need being met, luxury goods need being met, uh, heavy batteries, a star fortress, a military base, and a command relay. Uh, you might notice that those bonuses add up to more than 10. The maximum stability is 10. Now, there are also things that can negatively affect this, uh, things such as pirate raids, Luddic path interest, terrorist attacks from the pathers, um, supply shortages caused by mercantile convoys being destroyed. Um, there's also events such as just supply shortages that can be triggered dynamically by the game. Uh, other such things that can cause them to lower the stability of a market. Now, what does a st the stability do? Well, stability affects what goods are available for sale in a market. So because John Gala is so stable, you'll see here that the, the goods here are available in high volume and there's some decently available or interesting things like a hellbore. Uh, these goods are rarer and uh, more valuable and they are only going to be traded in markets that have high stability. In fact, you should keep an eye out for high stability markets if you're looking to buy something less common because those are more likely to have them. Um, and conversely, a low stability market will have significantly fewer goods available and also significantly less variety in goods. You might only see them having this bottom row here of the, the kind of tier one common weapons. Uh, it also affects, if we go over here to the fleet purchasing screen, it affects the availability of ships. There's a Prometheus tanker here, which is pretty nice. You know, some, some heavy freighters, if you go to the military, they have onslaughts griffins, eagles, even the black market's doing quite well. And this is all dependent upon a faction or a, a planet's market's uh, stability. And uh, if you want to, well, actually I should say, one other thing it can do is if you have a low stability for a long period of time, this can actually cause a planet to no longer be colonized. You can't necessarily glass a planet per se, um, like the, call in, the the different factions in the game can, but for you as the player, you can't just roll on over to a planet and blast it into oblivion. What you need to do if you want to get rid of a colony, like kill off an enemy faction's colony, is you have to reduce its stability to zero for a long period of time. And if you manage to do that, it will gain the dis decivilized um, malice. Doing so will make it so the planet is no longer colonized, no longer has a market, and you're free to walk, waltz on in and colonize it yourself should you feel the need. Last but not least, we're going to talk really quickly about the commodities window. So if you look here on the right side, we already kind of looked at this right here when we saw that there was only three needed instead of six, as we were describing before. But uh, there are some other things we need to look at on this screen. 
First off, if we want to see what these little symbols mean, we can just mouse over any one of these and press F1. This brings up our legend and it shows us that the gears mean that the demand is met through local production. The uh, little red box ones, they are smuggled or produced by an illegal enterprise, no income from exports. And then this one that shows the faction symbol, uh, this will be different for each um, faction planet you go to. So obviously if we're at the independence, it would have their symbol or you now you get, you get the picture anyway. This means that it is met through in-faction imports. So each faction will trade amongst its still. Okay, so there's an order of operations. First, it will attempt to meet the need through on-planet production. If it cannot meet the need through on-planet production, I'm, I'm talking about an industry, sorry. If an in, industry cannot meet its demand through the on-planet production, it will seek to do so through the faction production. Finally, if it's not able to meet that need through faction production, it will attempt to import it. Now, I don't believe there's any importation being done here of any of these necessary goods, so you won't see that. It's usually a little, uh, yeah, little gold arrow, as you can see there um, on the legend. And it met, says it's demand met through imports from outside the faction. So that's the order in which it attempts to do things. Now, for, for you guys, the, this stuff is more important for uh, later on when we start doing colony management. But the, the part that's interesting for a new player to the game who's looking to trade is these things right here. The little green outlines, little red outlines. What these mean are things that they have a surplus of on this planet and things that they have a uh, deficit of. Um, now, these are surpluses because they're not being exported. Like they, they, they have more than they need and they're not being exported off planet. You can see that if you look at the legend available, but not in demand or exported lower prices and deficit in demand, but not available higher prices. Now this translates directly into this screen. If you look here, you can see our, our organics as we saw here are in high supply. And so their price is quite low. If we press F1, you can bring up this little window and it shows us the five best places to sell and the five best places to buy. Well, look at that. It turns out that because Jean Gala here has an excess of 1,500 units, their price is currently 12 credits per unit, which is the best in the entire sector, which is pretty awesome. And uh, you also can notice, if you look carefully, the available is listed as 4,500 4, and the actual available is 4,480. So there's a little bit of uh, abstraction there, a little bit of um, rounding, but it, it's pretty accurate. Um, this is useful to help you uh, figure out what you're going to be selling and buying things at, but there is a problem in terms of making money this way in that if we buy these goods, you'll notice over here on the left side of the screen, we have something, a tariff, 30% tariff. We put those back and just grab one of them. You can see that tariff is 30%, but because of the rounding on 12, uh, 130% multiplier would put this at 15.6 credits. Star Sector doesn't deal with decimals on the credits, so it rounds it up to 16. Now the sharp eyed among you might have noticed that when I picked up the entire stack, the unit price was different, 26. Uh, that's because two reasons. If you look at the tooltip of organics here, the excess stockpile is 1500 units can be bought at a lower price, which means that after 1500 units, the price will go up dramatically. We can see that here if we grab the 1500 and we start grabbing more and the price should start shooting up quite quickly. Now, this, the prices in this game are dynamic based upon the number of goods currently in stock. So if you buy 1,500 units, you will pay more per unit than if you bought 900 units. If we drop this down back to 900. See, now it's at 16 again. If we buy the whole stack, it's at 26. So keep that in mind. It's not super important, but it's just something to, to pay attention to or at least to answer a question that you may have when you look at it and go hey i wonder why my unit price is different than when it's what it's listed as that's why 
It, the, the price is dynamically updated as you purchase goods in bulk. Now, if we were to, if we look at this list, buy here at Jean Gala at 12, well, 16 credits per unit due to the tariff, and then sell them at Chalcedon, the Ledic Path planet, for 34 units, which I believe would drop to around 27 or something like that. I don't know. I can't do the math in my head. You would actually end up with a profit of around 40,000 credits total rather than the over 90,000 you should be getting normally. And the reason for that is because you have to pay the tariff in both directions. You have to pay the tariff buying the goods and you have to pay the tariff selling the goods. This exists to prevent the game from devolving into just a little run goods back and forth from the same two markets indefinitely kind of thing. Um, it does mean, however, unfortunately, that most of the time this kind of trading is not going to be super profitable. Yes, you can make money this way, but it won't be a lot because you have to take into consideration also the uh, supplies paid to um, keep the ships you're using to move those goods online and also the fuel you're using to, to move those goods because it's six light years away. And uh, you're going to be moving several thousand organics. So you've got to have fairly large ships doing this. The end result is you're not going to make much profit. You might make some. It's probably going to be in the order of ten to 15,000, something like that. I'm like, not going to do the math, but the point is this is not the most productive way to make money. All right, so moving on to a way to get around those tariffs. All right, so I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, there's a 30% tariff on all purchases and sales. How on earth am I supposed to make money in this? Isn't there a way around those things? Of course, the answer is yes. There is a way around the tariffs. It's called smuggling. And smuggling is simply the act of selling goods, illegal or illegal, on the black market. So that button right here, that's the black market. Um, pretty much all markets will have these aside from planets that you own. And you can see here, they have both legal goods and uh, illegal goods, things like harvested organs and recreational drugs. If you wanna know what is considered illegal by a given faction, just click here on the Intel button, go to factions, and you will be able to click on a faction and see what it is they consider illegal for uh, trade. For example, they don't like AI cores, harvested organs, recreational drugs, or heavy armaments here in hegemony. Now, that's, that means they don't like them being traded on the open market. It doesn't mean that they don't use them per se. Um, for example, the heavy armaments are actively used in their defense batteries here on Jangala. And the recreational drugs are used by their miners, although they're still banned. So if we go back to our cargo, okay. Now, what are the bonuses to a black market? Very obviously the first one is there is no tariff. That costs 4,200 credits and you pay 4,200 credits. Now if we go to the open market and look at this little hellbore here at 3,600, well, you're still paying 4,680 because of that 30% tariff. So the black market that way is very nice. You're able to pay for the goods at the price that they are, uh, listed at. Another nice thing about them in some contexts is that the number or the, the the variety of goods available is dependent upon the stability but not in the way that goods are here. Here goods are more available, more there's more variety when stability is high. In black markets the stability is inversely proportional to the variety of goods so low stability equals more variety. Um, this is essentially a uh, in-game or a gameplay representation of how one might expect that a place with low stability might have you know, problems keeping their border secure. The police might be more busy trying to fight off pirates than they are worrying about somebody smuggling guns. And as a result, you're going to see a lot more stuff on the market. Now, the prices won't be as good at low stability because prices are affected by stability here in the black market just as they are in the open market. Uh, for example, those those organics are still 12 credits here. They're also quote 12 credits there. So that will it will increase the variety but also increase the price. Now, 
you're thinking to yourself that that sounds like a great deal like i can buy goods for their actual price and sell them for their actual value what's the downside well the downside is that selling goods or buying them on the black market will decrease the stability of a planet in question it will receive a stacking bone or a modifier that will slowly decrease the stability of a planet over time such as if you do a small amount of of smuggling you'll get a small modifier up here to, in the colony conditions it'll say smuggling active smuggling um and it will have a small modifier if you are say smuggling drugs it'll have a larger one and if you're just smuggling huge amounts of goods all the time like you're just using a planet as the dumping ground for your you know mercantile um convoy raids and you're just dumping everything you find into their black market they're going to have a huge huge negative modifier a malice to their stability and they're going to have serious problems because you're flooding their market with illegal goods so that that can definitely be a problem because if they have low stability because of your black market stuff that will be increasing the sale or the, the purchase price when if you buy stuff and decreasing the sale value of things so you'll be getting less for your your money and also it'll be affecting the availability of goods here and also the volume in which they're selling them so that's not a good thing um also you'll have fewer ships available although on the flip side it does mean it's a good way to destabilize a planet if you want to do it without without using weapons you can lower their stability by just flooding their market with drugs or whatever and that will decrease their stability as well if you're trying to do that as part of a uh, an invasion on a, a system or something now when you buy or sell goods you will arouse the suspicions of authorities and that suspicion level is shown here on the black market tab or if you move mouse over the button the little tooltip there at the bottom in orange has that suspicion level none i have not traded anything here at the black market and so they don't think there's anything to be suspicious about i'm an upstanding citizen you know they like me uh, as a result i can trade and go about my business without anyone interfering with me if i left jean gala right now i could just leave the system and no one would mind there would be no patrols who'd care nothing now if I was buying and selling goods on the black market, my suspicion level would be higher, and then I might be interdicted by a patrol and pulled over. And they ask me, hey, you know, you match the description of somebody who seems to have been doing something illegal back on uh, Jean Gala. We're, we've been told to pull you over and scan your cargo. You can say, uh, okay, officer, or you can say, no thanks, Popo, and, you know, try and fight him off, but that will basically be like declaring war on the faction it's a bad idea but the, the point is that trade will in the black market will increase your suspicion level um this is only true if your transponder is on see if we go out of here look at my little hop bar here my transponder is on and when i go to jean gala in this nice little text box here describing John Gallo there's this little paragraph at the end your fleet transmits identification codes via the transponder and you are soon granted docking clearance identification codes they know who you are they know when you arrived and they know when you leave and if there's a whole bunch of illegal trading going on all of a sudden right after you arrive that ends immediately when you leave they're not stupid <laughs> they're going to realize you did something illegal and that's what will raise their suspicion level now you can mask this by buying a lot of legal goods or selling a lot of legal goods as well but you're essentially you're creating a huge volume of trades for them to sift through and obviously if there's a whole bunch of trading going on that's legal it's harder to find the illegal stuff in the midst of it all so that is one way you can reduce your suspicion gain is by buying or selling a bunch of legal goods on the open market and then doing so on the black market now when i say at the same time it's not there's no special button to uh, make a simultaneous purchase or anything like that it's just as long as you don't leave the planet between the purchases you are considered having done it simultaneously enough to you know fulfill those purposes so as long as you just don't leave you're you're still considering them simultaneous simultaneous purchases for the purposes 
of masking your illegal goods. Now, if you approach with your transponder off, which I will cover soon about how to do that, but then they don't know who you are. There's no identification codes being transmitted, and as a result, there's no one to be suspicious of. They know trading happened, that was illegal, but they don't know who did it. Now, having your transponder off is illegal, so if they catch you with it off, they're going to scan you anyway, if there was a whole bunch of uh, illegal trading going on. But as a general rule, if you can get in there without getting caught and back out again, it will have very little effect on you if any, on your reputation, because they don't know who did it. They never saw you come in, they never saw you leave, they have no idea who did the trading, and they can't tie it to you reputation-wise. The effects on the market, however, persist. If you sell a bazillion goods through very sneaky black market trading, you will have a squeaky clean reputation, but their stability will still be in the trash. So, let's look at this real quick and see what happens when we buy something, just so you can kind of get an idea. I'm going to buy an Arbalest Auto Cannon. Oh, no suspicion. Let's buy a Devastator Cannon. Ooh, minimal suspicion. I didn't like that. Um, Let's see, what else can we buy? Oh, let's sell our fuel. Ooh, medium suspicion. Now they think something happened. Let's see if we can get the uh, the suspicion level to change back a little bit. Um, nope, I don't think we can do enough volume of goods to have an effect on that. But we're up to medium suspicion. They, they didn't particularly enjoy us doing those trades. Let's sell that on the black market, see if we can get our suspicion up a little higher, just for the purposes of the video. Uh, we'll buy some more supplies. There we go, very high. They didn't like that very much. <laughs> so they're thinking that maybe I've done something naughty. Let's let's try and leave the planet and see what happens. So is anybody after us? Did anyone come, come visit? Ooh, ooh, I think somebody might. Right there, hit Gemini Fast Picket, pursuing your fleet, despite being friendly. Now, if I tried to run away, they wouldn't appreciate that. You might get a, uh, rip I believe, I. I'm not sure if it's in this version, but I distinctly remember we're taking a uh, reputation hit for escaping a patrol. Because like I said, your transponder is on, they know who you are and they know what you were doing, kind of. They have a suspicion. And they figure if you ran, then you, they're almost certain that they were right. So let's go meet them. Oh, goodness. Huh. Our, there we go. You are here by order to submit to a cargo scan. Now, if you refuse and cut the comm link, you're essentially stating you'd rather fight don't do this unless you have a good reason to, or if you're a pirate. If you're a pirate, go for it. You know, if, if you, even if you have illegal goods, I'd recommend allowing the scan because one, the scan is not 100%. It can fail, and you might get away scot-free. Two, you'll take a much bigger reputation hit for fighting them off than you will for having illegal goods. And uh, three, there are ways to uh, modify the chances of that uh, scan being successful. The first is similar to the way you mask your suspicion at the market, and that's by having a good ratio of legal goods to illegal goods. The more legal goods you have per illegal good, the lower the chance that they'll be able to find your contraband amidst all of the actual legal items you're carrying. If you have a, you know, three or four thousand metal and a couple of drugs buried there, there in the middle, that's going to be really hard for them to find. Um, the other way is a hull mod known as shielded cargo holds. This is a fairly common hull mod on lower value pirate vessels. I do not believe it's possible to put on your ships. If it is, well, then I'll make a note about that in the future, but I believe it can only be found on pre-existing uh, hulls. And the, uh, the ships it can be found on are the Hound, the Cerberus, uh, the pirate buffalo, the pirate mule, and the pirate versions, of course, of the hound and Cerberus as well. Now, the way that shielded cargo holds work is they will shield the portion of the goods that are illegal that fit in their hull. So, like a, let's say, the pirate mule. I don't actually know off the top of my head how many, uh, how much cargo it holds, but let's say it holds 300 cargo, just for a fun number. And let's say you have 200 drugs. 
well, it's then going to be shielding all 200 of those drugs and will be uniformly decreasing the chance of them being identified during a scan by, uh, by these guys. Now, the, the chance can never be zero. It is impossible to reduce the chances for your cargo to be found, your illegal cargo to be found to zero, but you can reduce it dramatically with shielded cargo holds. But if you're carrying a thousand drugs and only one of your, your cargo holds is shielded with you know those 300 cargo holds, or only one of your ships has shielded cargo holds, and so you have those 300 shielded, only those 300 will receive that modifier. The actual calculations that go into whether or not your uh, scan is successful is really complicated um, with a lot of factors involved, but basically the, the too long didn't read part is have lots of legal goods to mask your illegal ones and have shielded cargo holds if possible if you're planning on smuggling. Both of those together will help you get past cargo scans. Now, this is only applicable if you're planning on smuggling while keeping your transponder on, which there are advantages to doing. I mean, you're not going to get intercepted nearly as often. Um, if you're just selling illegal goods and you haven't been to that market in a while, keep your transponder on. Just roll in, sell the goods, take the suspicion hit, walk out, and they won't be able to do anything to you. You might take a tiny reputation hit just for the volume of goods, but at the end of the day, you still made your money. Now, if you're a dedicated smuggler and you do this regularly, you might want to go the route of uh, running dark. But before we get there, let's allow the scan. You'll see that no contraband or suspicious cargo was found, and we lost no reputation because we have a squeaky cleaner record prior to this, and they just don't have a reason to be mad at us. Um, even if you pass the scan, though, it is possible to lose reputation if you have been doing this a lot and they know that you're probably doing something illegal or if you're masking your goods really well. If you roll in with 10,000 metal ore on top of your you know, heavy weapons or whatever, they're not going to find anything, but they're still going to give you a reputation hit because they have you have too much to scan. They know you have too much to scan, and they know that you know you have too much to scan. And they're going to be like, hey, this is sketchy. This is super sketchy. You look like you're doing something illegal. We just can't prove it. So you'll get a small reputation hit just for kind of being a dick. But that's about it. All right, so let's head back in. And we'll leave that behind because we don't want to die. Alrighty, now on to being sneaky. Alright, so being sneaky. We are find ourselves here in Nemo's belt, the asteroid belt in the Corvus star system. And we're not going to try and sneak into Jangala because that place is a, uh, a fortress and also a military world, which is why it's a fortress. We're going to go and try and sneak into a Sharu. Now, at the moment, uh, let's see, we can right-click to unlock our camera. We can't see anything around a Sharu, but there probably is something. Our uh, sensor range is just really terrible right now. Um, oh yeah, to, to determine sensor range, the game uses the sensor strength stat of the five best ships in your fleet. So the, the, not the top or anything, just the ships with the five the five highest sensor strength ratings is averaged, and that is your sensor strength. And then for how far away you can be detected, your detection range is the five most detectable ships, the, the ships with the highest sensor profile, the five of them are averaged. So in case you had any questions how the stat is determined, there you go. So we want to have our detection range as small as possible. Now, if you look at this, there's a big number right there, well, plus 1,000 from our transponder being on. The other thing that causes a huge increase in detection range is having your um, sustained burn on. Let's see if we just move for a sec. We should, yeah, there we go. Obviously, we're detectable from very far away, plus 100% from sustained burn and plus 1,000 from our transponder being on. So let's turn off both of these. To turn off your transponder, you have to click it twice because it's a serious thing to do. You can get in trouble for it by local police. So the game makes sure you actually want to do it. Now, let's sit still in this asteroid belt for a second. And ooh, ooh. Now our detection range is tiny. Sensor profile of 142. 
Now, if we want to decrease this even further, we can go dark and just hang out for a second. Now, what this actually does is it max or it, it, it caps out the uh, speed at which you can move. While going dark, you have a limit of speed five. Uh, that might be higher if your maximum speed is higher, but it, it caps your uh, maximum speed. And below that, that maximum speed of five, your detection range is dramatically reduced. If we turn off um, going dark and just go move very slowly in very small increments so that we never get above. No, never mind. I take that back. Ooh, somebody detected us. See, now, actually, this is great. So these little circles you kind of see that the circle you can imagine extends farther that's the detection range of that fleet he just detected us he couldn't see us prior in fact if we go dark right now he there you go even though that circle moved beyond us now it's right there he can only detect us if we get that close to him and yes this does have it so forget what i was saying this halves your maximum detection range it's it's very good the reason it was lowered before is because we were hanging out in an asteroid belt, which also reduces your detection range. So if your target planet or station is in an asteroid belt, then move along the asteroid belt and your detection range will be microscopic. So let's try and get to Ashara. We'll just speed up time by holding shift there because this is really slow. And let's see if we can, oh, well, there's that. That's a debris field, but we're not seeing any planet or any people around the planet. So we'll just zoom on in here. Boop. All right. So in the previous section, I talked about how with your transponder on, this paragraph says that you transmit your transponder codes. Here, your fleet goes into our orbit around the Sharu. The local port authority seems to take no issue with your explanation for why your transponder regrettably can't be turned on. So Asharu is an independent planet. Independents don't care about you smuggling. Well, they don't care about you um, coming in with transponder off. So you can actually still trade on the open market with your transponder off. But if this was at Jangala, for example, they would not appreciate that. In fact, let's go to another save and see if I can sneak into a planet. And uh, we'll take a look at what that looks like. All right, so we find ourselves in the Thule system, or Thule system, I'll never know how to pronounce that correctly. And uh, we are looking to arrive at Kazeron. Now, Kazeron is a military world. I, I just happened to be where my other save was. That's not ideal, but we are going to try and sneak in there. Uh, we have not been detected. We were not inside the detection radius of any other um, fleet when we went dark, so nobody's coming looking for us right now. And uh, I'll explain that in just a moment if we happen to see it. But let, let's move in and see if we can get closer. Now, right now, because we're in this cloud, plus going dark, our detection radius is really small. If we mouse over these guys, you can see their detection range. If we get closer than the edge of that ring that's right there, they will see us even though we're running dark. That's the range of their sensors. And if you notice, that that's pretty darn big. <laughs> that extends almost, if you extrapolate the size of that, it, basically runs to the other side of the planet. So I'm not sure how we're going to get in there, because if they're in orbit, they will detect us when we reach their uh, world. I guess if we reach the station, the station doesn't care. So if we wait until the station was right there and they were on the far side, we might be able to get in there. Anyway, uh, back to what I was saying. This radius is dynamic if I had my sustained burn and transponder on this ring would be way out to like there and if I was anywhere inside of this and went dark they would come looking for me because I essentially just disappeared off their sensors and they find that confusing and suspicious so they're going to come look for, for me if I happened to be at this planet left went outside their sensor range went dark and then came back, they would not come look for, looking for me because I went off their sensors naturally, the way it's supposed to happen. They wouldn't be thinking, oh, something illegal is happening here. They'd be thinking, well, they're leaving, and they wouldn't be looking for me. There'd be no reason for them to suspect I was in the area. All right, so because these uh, rings, these asteroid belts are so good for stealth, we're going to try and stay in them. Um, we might get run over. This is probably the wrong way to go. We should probably be approaching from the left side here because there's a jump point. So fleets will be moving in and out and they might see us. 
So actually, let's sneak back this way. Oh, someone detected us. That was an active sensor burst. They know we're here. So someone should be looking for us, I would think. Or maybe not. If you notice, there was a ring that popped out and then went back. That was a sensor burst. Somebody actively sensor burst, and sensor burst increases your detection range by 3,000 units. So it is really helpful for them finding things and really dangerous for people who don't want to be found. So, all right, let's do. Oh. Okay. Pre preparing for patrol duty. See if we can wait for him to be on patrol. I'm not sure exactly how long that takes, but it might be a little bit. Now our own detection, our own sensor radius is reduced when we're in those rings, so this makes this a little difficult. I apologize that this is taking a while, but this is realistic for how long it takes to sneak into planets. It can be difficult, it can take time, it will be hard. Ooh, there's a planetary impact there, was it? Or an asteroid impact? There's a fleet moving around. Oh, this is so close. They're returning to Kazeron. They may not care about us. I'm not certain. They're going to come in and then begin orbiting. So we might want to move that way to kind of, oh, stay out of their detection radius. Oh, they saw us. Do they care? Yep, they care. Run! Now, if they were standing down, I'm not sure that they would care about us. Traveling to Nav Boy. Okay. Oh. All right, back in we go. This really can be quite a chore. It is very difficult to get into some planets. Obviously, ones with military detachments and uh, huge fleets make it extra difficult. Now he's orbiting Kazeron. He's going somewhere else. Now the, the best time to try and get into a planet is when something else is happening in the system. If there's pirates nearby or um, a Ludic Path fleet or something attacking, all of these defense fleets will shoot off to try and fight it. And that is your opportunity as a little smuggler to go in and take a look and sell things because they're going to be distracted. Because obviously right now this is going to be really, really hard. Okay, this is our chance right here. We're going to go for it. Mm, okay, come on. Speedy, speedy. Can we get there? They're looking for us. They haven't found us, though. They don't know where we are. Okay, we made it in. Good, 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 good. We are here at Kazeron. Now, if you look here at this last paragraph, it is different. No Persian League patrol seem to be aware of you just yet, and you have a window of opportunity for doing business with parties untroubled by your lack of docking clearance. Basically, they don't care. They're not going to worry about it. Um, just to test, let's see if we can sell some things on the black market. Suspicion level, none, because they don't know we're here. So, there you go. That is how to smuggle. I'm not going to show how to get out again because I'm probably not going to be able to. Um, well, actually, no, let's play. Actually, never mind. I take that back. When you leave after smuggling, it's really simple. If you're going to get detected, you just run for your life because they don't know who you are. Uh, detected, so I'm going to run. Bye bye. And they don't feel like chasing me. So we're away scot free. And there we go. We have successfully smuggled to Kazeron without being caught, detected, blown up, anything like that. So there you go. That was a successful smuggling run. Next on our list are COM relays. Now do, the COM relays are domain era FTL communication network components. These things right here, uh, if you don't know what the domain is, that's a thing from the game store basically a long time ago, big, huge empire of man. Nowadays, much less so. <laughs> There's a lot less of it around. And um, we can't build these things the way they did, but uh, they're still around, and they're used to communicate between systems faster than light. They're very, very powerful, very useful, and they're the 
main way that communication occurs around the uh, the Corvus or the Corvus, the Perseus uh, sector. Perseus sector. There we go. <clears throat> they essentially function like space Twitter. <laughs> the fleets in hyperspace can pick up comm messages from a relay if they are within half a light year of it. So if we open up our map, go to the sector. I believe that one of these grids is a light year. I'm not actually certain about that. Maybe not. Oh, here we go. <laughs> no, I was totally wrong. So there we go. One light year is about that far. And this is dynamic. So you can see here this little bar shows you the, uh, the light years between things. Anyway, so if your fleet is within half a light year of a comm relay, you will be able to pick up messages from it. You can pick up both public messages and you have a small chance to pick up coded messages. Coded messages are ones that are between um, various parts of a faction. They are generally not available normally and um, getting them can give you very useful information, but the chance to pick them up just randomly is very low. Um, you probably won't even notice it happen if you do. Uh, so I'm honestly, I didn't know it was possible until I was reading through the wiki and stuff. So yeah, it, it, it's a very low chance. But there is a way to get access to these on a much more regular basis, these coded messages. And the way you do it is by installing a comm sniffer on these nice little relays here. And I, I've chosen to go to John Gala right now because the uh, picket that was defending this um, relay is heading home. So we're just going to pop on over there right now and hopefully get there before he notices. Okay, turn off our sustained burn and we're going to install a comm sniffer. We're not going to take control of the relay because that'll piss off the entire hegemony fleet here in Corvus. I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to uh, install a comm sniffer. So it'll give you access to local intel as if you were in this star system. Let's proceed. All right. A quick scan shows that uh, several, there are several common vulnerabilities to choose from, and the sniffer script is uploaded. Yeah, the sniffer script is uploaded within a few minutes. Back in the day, this used to take time on the map, and you'd actually have to sit there and hope they didn't catch you while you did it. Now you can just approach the relay and do so. Do not do so. If a patrol can see you, if they see you messing with it, they'll come talk to you about it. It's not considered appropriate. Now, a comm sniffer provides intel for the faction that owns it and only intel from the faction that owns it. You can have as many comm sniffers as you like because there's obviously more than one relay. There's one in Jangala, uh, there's one in Galatia. I think there's one in every single. Um, core system and there's actually several outside of it as well see there's the, the comm relay right there i know you can run into them in the periphery but they're not as reliably there and you can actually build a uh, makeshift comm relay as well relay as well if you happen to decide to do so um, can be useful in certain circumstances but anyway if you have a comm sniffer there you get information from that uh that group and if you take control, or not take control, if you calm sniff more than one relay, there is a stacking chance of having that sniffer discovered. So now if you have one relay sniffed, there, that, that, that sniff will never be detected. They cannot detect the calm sniffer on a single relay. After the first, there is a 20% chance for each um, relay with a sniffer on it to be detected per month. So if you have five or more relays, no, six or more, sorry, six or more relays with comm sniffers on them, you will lose a comm sniffer at least one per month until that drops below six, because at six, the, the stacking chance becomes 100%. And when you uh, have a comm sniffer removed, it begins a little event uh, it's all in the game script. You don't see it. It doesn't interact with you until you actually see the results. But essentially, they put you on trial, and if you are found guilty, convicted, they will cause a reputation loss for you because you know you were doing illegal, sneaky things, and they didn't like it. It is possible that you will not be convicted and will suffer no consequences for it besides losing your comp sniffer. 
Now, we've gone through how to um, snet what, uh, set one up, uh, but what is the intel provided by sniffers? Well, this information is proprietary, it's faction specific, and you will generally not be aware of this unless you accidentally intercept and decrypt it. So there are some things you will be available, or you will find available, such as uh, mission offers, but other things uh, you will find out about that you may not know about otherwise are things like fleet departures. Um, they don't generally advertise when they're sending their, uh, their mercantile fleets around. No, don't want to do that in case pirates are lurking, such as possibly yourself. And so having access to a comm relay on, of the faction you're trying to, uh, to pirate is very useful because you can know when they're sending their mercantile fleets around the, the system or the, the sector and know which places they're going from and to. Uh, it's possible that you become aware of um, the trade convoy information, um, procurement missions, so missions to go get goods for a faction. They say, hey, Corvus, you know, John Gala is short of something. So you'll find out about that and can actually supply goods for a dramatically increased value um, and without having to deal with the, uh, what's it called, the tariff. So if you go and if they say we need 10,000 um, transplutonic ore in John Gala, if you supply that 10,000 transplutonic ore, you'll be able to um, do so without having to deal with the tariff, I believe. I'm not certain about that. See missions. We don't have any of, of those available. Um, you can also deal with shortages, like they say, oh, that Corvus is short of transplutonic ore, but there isn't an actual procurement mission. They're just saying that they have a shortage. That means that that is going to be a very good place to sell goods there, or there is a um, an overabundance. So obviously that place will be a good place to go uh, buy things from. You also will get these kind of missions more readily, more quickly. It says 120 days to complete. You get them earlier um, than you normally would. They're generated at a system. These are not generated globally, so information takes time to travel. I believe it's at five light years a day or something like that from its point of origin. So if you're on the far side of the core, it might take a little while for a message to get to you through the, uh, the relay network if you aren't close to where it comes from. But anyway, that is how uh, missions are acquired too. So you want to have com, at least one comm sniffer, especially if you want to either be friends with a faction or you want to steal from them. So then you get these things. You get missions to go on, go on and explore the sector. These are both exploration missions. And missions to go kill things. Those are fun. They uh, fall into two categories, the kind where you go and uh, kill a specific fleet, usually with um, a lot of interesting things about it. Um, they have an interesting fleet composition sometimes, and they'll, they often have a lot of uh, officers in them, but they're worth a lot of money. These can be very challenging, and they scale upwards as you do better and better. These ones are just, they're basically war commissions. Uh, they're saying, hey, there's pirates or whatever. Anyone like if, if they offer a system bounty in Corvus, it means if you kill anything hostile to uh, the hegemony or the hegemony us hostile to, you will be paid a bounty for it. So base reward of that much per frigate, and that that scales upwards with the uh, class of ship. So if you're killing cruisers, you're going to get a lot of money. If you're killing battleships, you're going to making a ton. And of course, you can see who people are. Uh, like the hegemony is hostile to, for instance, by clicking on the faction tab, clicking on here, and you'll see their known enemies. This doesn't change too, too much, but it's nice to know where it is, especially if you play modded, because it does change a lot, and there this becomes a very, very long drop-down type kind of thing. So anyway, those are the two kinds of uh, missions you can get there. And there are others. Like I said, I don't have all of them available here, but... Yeah, so that is what comm sniffers are for. They're a very useful thing. They allow you to gain information you wouldn't otherwise be able to and uh, do so in a way that's much quicker than just waiting for it to disseminate out through the normal news channels. So just remember, when you're installing a comm sniffer, the basics are don't do so when someone can see you doing it. If you have to uh, maybe sneak in, that's probably not a bad idea. 
Um, generally, you shouldn't have to, though. Just wait for the patrol, the picket, to leave. There's usually only a single picket fleet, and it only t it's, it's just a dialogue option nowadays. It's no longer a, um, a timed event, so you can just run in, do it, and run away, and you won't have any problems. So there we go. All right, before we wrap this up, I want to take a look at a few more ways to make money in Star Sector. Now, of course, one of those ways is to sell ships. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing this. I've said this before and people have had questions about it. You don't make a lot of money selling ships. Um, obviously, this ship is fully repaired and armed and it's only worth 6,000 credits. If I bought it new, I don't know if they have any of this class here, but they have another destroyer and it's 60,000 credits. So clearly, you don't want to be buying and selling ships. That's just not a valid market. However, if you salvage ships, do not repair them and just take the hulls back, uh, mothball them immediately when you salvage them and then sell them at a market. You can make a small premium. It's not worth a lot, but it's definitely worth doing if you just happen to be on your way to somewhere else. Um, another great way to make money, one of my favorite ways actually, is to take a shuttle down to the dockside bar. This is available at almost every market. And then look for this right here nod to the concerned man and walk over to his table. This will give you a contract if you accept. So he wants me to deliver 190 units of food to Alamar in the Western Star system. I need nine, or I need 100 more units of cargo space because I only have 90 free right now. If I had 100 more, so I had 190, I could take this contract and then for 10,000 credits, he will let me do that. This is great because I don't pay for the goods and I don't pay any tariffs on selling them. I just get nine, I get 10,000 credits straight up for just moving this from point A to point B. My only expense, of course, is the supplies used on the way and the fuel. So if you have the space, these are great. Um, they're not super common, like they're not at every planet. I wouldn't recommend hunting them exclusively. These are things to do while doing other things. If you've finished what you were doing in the system, look at a few of the planets, see if any of them have these, and if they do, use that to determine where you're going next if you don't have a specific goal of where you want to be next in mind. It's a great way to do that. Basically, it makes it so that your travel is paid for, because you'll make a little bit more than you'll spend on your uh, expenses traveling. And these scale with the size of your fleet. Um, if you have, you know, 4,000 units of cargo available most of the time, this will take that into account and these will be much larger contracts for a lot more money. So I, I definitely recommend taking those. Um, they'll be less common, I believe, if you have a very combat-oriented fleet, but that's not a big issue. If you're a very combat-oriented player, you won't care about these anyway. So they can just be a fun way to uh, make money while you're traveling. Another way is to get a loan from... Oh, uh, whoops, this is the wrong one. This is the AI core mission. Normally, you can find a, uh, a man. It's not an academic. It's a, it'll be a Tritachion man. If you find a Tritachion man at a bar, or when, I can't remember. I think it's usually a guy. But anyway, it's an individual at a bar with a Tritachion uh, suit. They will offer you a fairly large loan, usually in the order of 200 to 300,000 credits and require that you paid that and about 20 to 30 percent interest within a year or something like that uh, if you do this you'll obviously get a huge amount of money which you can then use as capital to make more money if you're confident you can make back the cash required to pay them back go ahead and do it um also if you hate tai tri tachyon go ahead and do it and then just don't pay them back because if you don't it'll if you don't pay them back, it'll set them hostile to you. Uh, Tritachion will send out bounty hunters after you, I believe. But if you don't like Tritachion anyway, then that's not a big deal. Then you can just kill their ships and get Tritachion ships. Yay! Either way, um, it's a decent way to make money. And if you need it, if you're in desperate need of a cash flow injection, uh, or if you're looking to, you know, get that one thing you need before you're able to to start to really make cash, then go ahead with the Tritachion one. If you're not confident, I'd probably give it a pass in your first playthrough. Maybe on, maybe later on, you, you can do it. But generally, in the early game, if you do know what you're doing, then it's great. If you 
don't know what you're doing, then by the time you are able to pay that back, it's probably not worth taking in the first place. So just a thought. All right. So last thing I want to talk about here in this video is about fleet composition for trading. Uh, people have a lot of questions about fleet composition and uh, that's no different for the trade stuff. Um, it really comes down to what do you want to do? Do you want to be trading huge amounts of legal goods? Um, then you're going to be looking for one of these suckers or maybe multiple ones of these things. Atlas super freighters are excellent ships. If you do buy one, I would strongly recommend that you refit it with the uh, hull mods. I don't have them here because I'm not um, very, I don't have any of the extra hull mods at the moment, but you want augmented drive field, which will increase your speed on the, the map by two. And then probably uh, expanded cargo holds, which will increase your cargo holds by 30%. So that's just getting more bang for your buck from your ship. Um, it has some negative side effects, but none of them are significant enough to change the fact that that'll increase your cargo holds by like 600, which is essentially another freighter, another small freighter, but another freighter. So, um, and actually that, that advice is pretty relevant to most kinds of freighters you can find. Um, the additional cargo holds and augmented drive fields, if they're below a speed of about nine, you probably want to put the augmented drive fields on them. But uh, anyway, so yeah, if you're looking to be a dedicated hauler that moves just thousands of goods across the sector for procurement contracts for, um, you know, planets and stuff to shore up their economies when they have problems, you're going to be looking for atlases and the ships to defend them. And since you're going to be slow, you're going to be looking for some heavy fighting craft. Like, you're going to want to be tough because you're going to be a big juicy target and everyone's going to want a piece of you. So you're going to be looking at onslaughts and griffins and eagles and stuff like they've got right here or paragons, whatever. You're going to need some serious firepower. If you're looking to be a bit more agile, but still have a lot of cargo capacity, look no further than this little guy right here. Well, not the specific one, because this is a modified Colossus, but this guy, haha. This one right here is a just the workhorse. I have these all the time. I usually have multiple of them, or at least one, because 900 crew or cargo capacity with only a maintenance of six per month is fantastic. Um, the other thing, the the one you take if you are a a bit scrappier and want to be able to really move around a lot, is the mule. The mule is a great freighter, and it's tough. This guy's a combat freighter. I wouldn't recommend putting them as a main line or anything, but as a ship who can distract and, and keep uh, some frigates off your tail while you kill their uh, ships of the line kind of thing, look no farther than the mule. He's excellent at it. He's, he's, they are, they're hard to kill. They don't kill things well by any means, but they're hard to put down, especially if you give them some decent uh, point defense. And so they'll, they'll, they'll keep coming back after you keep things try and kill them. They're a really good ship. I would not recommend the buffaloes as much they're okay they're decent price if you look at this thing it's a uh, 250 cargo capacity with a maintenance of seven so obviously they're they're even more maintenance than the uh, default colossus but they have a lot more car or combat capacity this guy is is much more in line with the uh, colossus he has 300 for three maintenance it's not quite as good a ratio but if you can't find a colossus these little buffaloes will do well in a pinch I would get rid of them fairly quickly, though. I don't, I don't like them. The main reason is their maximum burn is only 8, which is pretty low. So I, I generally get a Colossus slap augmented drive field on it to pop it up to 9, and expanded cargo holds in this thing can carry something like 1120 cargo and move at a maximum burn speed of 9, which makes him an excellent exploration freighter on top of that. That's the other thing. If you're going to be having freighters, you, it's better in general, unless you have a specific circumstance that would change this, but it, it's better in general to have fewer bigger freighters than lots of smaller ones. If you're going to have 2,000 cargo capacity in your fleet, take an Atlas. Rather, well, not an Atlas. Okay, there's Atlas's extenuating circumstances, but take a Colossus over three buffaloes. Three buffaloes are the same cargo capacity as a Colossus, but a Colossus uses three fuel per light year. 
a buffalo uses two per light year. So if three buffaloes are using six fuel, this would only use three. Just a little thing to think about. Now, the Atlas is kind of a special circumstance because this sucker uses 10 fuel per light year. So yeah, it's not very efficient that way. But at the same time, it's it's this thing is more if you want to move a huge amount of, fleet of, of materials and you don't want to take up in very many slots because you can only have up to 25, I believe it's 25, maybe it's 30 ships. I can't remember exactly. Fleets, or ships in your fleet. So if you have all of your ship slots filled up, save one or two, whatever, you're going to want to maximize the cargo capacity you can fit in there with things like atlases. If you have some to spare, then your little Colossus here is a much more efficient use of your uh, your fuel. And of course, if you're looking to be a, a sneaky, sneaky little smuggler who wants to be trading highly illegal goods for a lot of profit, but not necessarily huge volume, you're going to want to be looking at little guys like the Hound because of its shielded cargo holds. Also, it's really fast. You know, 10 maximum burn, and it burns excellent. Um, you can get away with the Colossus, but it's a little big. The, the, you know, augmented drive fields up to 10, or up to 9 is pretty good, and then with the, the crew or character skill from uh, the um, technology tree here that increases your maximum burn by 1, you can get a Colossus up to a speed 10, which is pretty good. Uh, you'll be able to outrun a lot that way. It's... The problem with the Colossus in that case becomes that it has a fairly large sensor profile as opposed to the sensor profile of somebody like the, uh, the Hound that's really, really small. So, yeah, that, those are the things you want to take into consideration when you're composing your fleet. Um, basically, tailor your freighters to your combat ships. If you're going to have a ton of huge combat ships, take big freighters. If you're going to be taking smaller, faster cruisers, take Colossuses. If you're going to be running around really sneaky, take smaller, faster things um, you know, like the Hound. Actually, that, that's one of the things about the pirate ships is that most pirate ships have decent cargo capacity. Uh, if you look here at, say, oh, they don't have one, do they? A Lasher. A Lasher actually has some semi-decent cargo capacity as do things like shepherds, hounds. It's not fantastic, but it's enough that if you have a bunch of pirate ships, you're going to have moderately good cargo capacity as opposed to like an actual combat fleet that tends to have a lot less. Um, the midline ships aren't as noticeable in this, but for example, the broadside, or the shrike, sorry, it's not a shrike, it's a broadside modification to the shrike or version, variant. There we go, that's the word I'm looking for. It has very low cargo capacity, and that is indicative of many combat ships. They tend not to have very much. Basically just enough to keep the supplies that they need to keep running on them, and, and that's about it. And this becomes more true, I believe, with the high-tech ships as well. But anyway, you get the point. You want to tailor your, your freighters to your fleet. Um, as always, you really should focus on combat in terms of how you compose your fleet because at the end of the day you are going to have to fight sometimes and you need your fleet to be ready for it so make sure your your freighters aren't forcing you into combats your your combat ships ships can't handle or handle but anyway i think that about wraps this up for our trade video so thank you guys so much for watching of course, as always, if you liked what you saw, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. If you have any questions about anything I said here, any corrections you want to make or stuff you'd like to see in the future, leave a comment and I will respond to that. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.